Amongst the brutal devastation of one of the worst natural disasters on record. That was a scary deal. A love story rises above the rubble. They felt like they owned the city. But as the city rebuilds around them, this couple's tale turns deadly. I've seen quite a few murder scenes and everything paled in comparison to this. It's one of the most gruesome crimes in New Orleans history. We were all looking at each other like, what did we just see? The search for answers takes us to the paranormal. It's very easy to get a spirit attachment in the city of New Orleans. What role did this killer storm have in one man's living nightmare? The city was abandoned, so they were basically sitting ducks. I firmly believe that he was possessed. Prepare to go deep into the darkness of the unknown, exploring real tales of demonic possession and exorcism in one of the most haunted cities in America. Some of these spirits, I don't believe there's good, bad. Maybe there is. America is filled with dark and traumatic events. There are some who believe these events leave evidence of what took place. Hot spots filled with unexplained activity. These are the stories of haunted history. New Orleans, Louisiana, one of the most historic and haunted cities in America. In August of 2005, the city is hit by one of the most violent natural disasters in history. Then, a bizarre crime takes place in the notorious French Quarter. We actually saw body parts that was apparently cooked. Some believe it could have been the work of demonic spirits. The grisliness, the gruesomeness of the crime, I firmly believe that Zach was possessed. How could a brutal storm and local mysticism turn an ordinary man into a killer? Our search for answers begins in the history of New Orleans itself. Built on swampland believed to have been an Indian burial ground. From its very beginning, New Orleans was a spiritual gumbo of voodoo, religion, and black magic. Locals say that in this town, the spirits never sleep and that they walk among the living. New Orleans is also no stranger to natural disasters. Because of its proximity to the Gulf of Mexico and the fact that over 50% of the city is below sea level, hurricanes have always wreaked havoc in the area. In 1722, the first major storm hit the city and nearly wiped it from the map. Since 1759, over 170 hurricanes have struck the Louisiana coast. Because of the city's history with disaster, New Orleans and its citizens developed a belief they could handle anything Mother Nature would throw at them. Then came the ultimate test. August 28, 2005. After forming over the Bahamas almost a week earlier, Hurricane Katrina set its sights on southeast Louisiana. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is the real deal. There is a major, major hurricane that has New Orleans in its sights. Mayor Ray Nagan called a mandatory evacuation order, but he called it very late. The worst part of the storm is almost here. Because of the tide surge from the relentless rain and winds, 53 levees around the perimeter of the city breach, causing catastrophic flooding. The trees were blowing in a zillion directions and the water was rising so quickly. The water rose probably five feet in the first five minutes. Here it comes, it's in the house. Oh no. Sure thought I'd die initially. We thought we had avoided the worst. And then at 7 p.m., we were told to expect eight additional feet of water. Many of the, in the city were streaming toward the Superdome. About 8 o'clock that night, we had probably taken on 12,000 people. That was uh, a scary deal. No lights, no police. It was sort of a, uh, a war zone-looking area. You felt threatened. You were afraid. 
We didn't know what the future was going to be. You know, there was just a lot of unknowns. Many citizens make it out. Others weren't so lucky. It was surreal, just flying over the city. Didn't hear any cars, nothing. In the end, over 1,800 people lost their lives in one of the most tragic events on American soil. Many people lost everything that they had. So many things that people took for granted were just wiped off the face of the map. Really, the heart and soul of the city was just kind of gone. Almost 80% of New Orleans is underwater. It looked like scenes from some nuclear blast somewhere. You know, I've been to combat, you've seen stuff in Iraq, but this is totally different than what you, what you experienced because of the total destruction. One small section of New Orleans is spared from Katrina's wrath, the famed French Quarter. Known for its Mardi Gras celebrations and bohemian culture, it's one of the oldest parts of the city. And one of the highest, in some spots sitting 10 feet above sea level. This is where a few brave residents choose to stay and face the storm together. And this is where Zack's story begins. Hello, my name is Zach Bowen. I hail from California. Then I moved to Seattle, Washington. Then I moved to Portland, Oregon. Then I a big road trip and ended up in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And then we ended up here. I've lived in New Orleans for about three years now. Zack was unusually tall. I'm six foot two, and I had to look up to see Zack. I like to think I'm somewhere of an artist. I write poetry, I'm a musician. My paying profession is a bartender. I'm also a drummer on the side, which will hopefully be my paying profession. I've been playing drums since I was four years old, being on lots of bands in the kitchen and driving my mom nuts. Zack always came across as kind of a calm, kind of quiet guy. Really, he felt you felt Zach was a gentle spirit. I'm a very, very laid back person. I don't have much of a temper at all. Ethan Brown, author of the book Shake the Devil Off, has done extensive research on Zach's life. In the summer of 2005, when he was working at this bar on Charter Street, he meets Addie Hall. Addie was kind of short. She had kind of a peppery personality. She was kind of feisty. She was pretty talkative. She played guitar, was interested in songwriting. She was a poet. She was a dancer. She was very similar to Zach in a lot of ways. Zach and Addie's relationship strengthens when they ride out the hurricane together. I know that Zach's friends and his family told him he needs to leave New Orleans. He refused to do so. He and Addie then hunkered down in an apartment that Addie had rented in the French Quarter. They stayed in this apartment as Katrina struck and as the levees failed and flooded the city. When the storm ends, it's clear that the French Quarter has been spared. Because the city was emptied out, save for a few people who decided to stick it out, they had this idyllic time where they basically felt like they owned the city. At Addie's apartment on Governor Nichols Boulevard, the couple partied up with the few locals that held out. Their spirit and energy make them favorites in the French Quarter. This is where they really fell in love. This is where they got to know each other under these, you know, incredible circumstances of Katrina. After the floodwaters recede, citizens slowly make their way back into the city. Zach and Addie began to realize very quickly that the city is going to be repopulated. And the world that they had shared during Katrina was over. The daily life of work and paying bills came back very quickly. And this really threw the both of them out of sorts. Zach and Addie aren't the only ones out of sorts. The citizens returning begin to realize not only has New Orleans been devastated, but a paranormal force is rising. New Orleans is a very historic city and it's always been very spiritually active. After the storm, it's become very active in terms of paranormal activity. Could be because after the storm, things were stirred up. Spiritual activity is increasing throughout the city. Only now, it's much darker. 
After Hurricane Katrina, the spiritual energy was just very negative. The whole city literally had a wretched stench to it. You could almost call it like the stench of death. You could definitely feel a difference. It was a vacant feeling, a heavy feeling. You could just feel that it was heavy with the dead. And it's not just local residents who notice the ominous changes. Spirits are also seen by outsiders. The Sophie B. Wright School, occupied by soldiers, many of whom feel they're not alone. I opened my eyes, and in the doorway was a little girl. I was standing in there getting cleaning supplies, and there was a little girl laughing. Boats were tossed like paper, yet soldiers found a Bible laying open to Revelations 10 and 11. It talks about a great storm that lasts three days, that washes away a city. At first, some scoff, then putting it all together, the presence of something, if not just the power of nature, cannot be scorned. Throughout New Orleans, paranormal activity is increasing. Is it possible this unexplained phenomena could lead to murder? On October 17, 2006, Detective Tom Morovich of the New Orleans Police Department answers a dispatch call to the Omni Hotel in the French Quarter. Uh, initially, we were dispatched to uh, a signal 29S, which is a suicide, located at this address at the hotel. Morovich and his partner are led to the roof of the parking structure next to the hotel. We can see the body laying on the ground. We were, you know, looking around, trying to find out and identify who is this person and what were the events that led up to him jumping. The coroner finds a small plastic bag in the man's pocket. It contains a suicide note and military dog tags. The name on the tags is Zachary Bowen. Coming up, what could have broken Zach's spirit and caused him to take his own life? It just didn't make sense that he had done this. Perhaps the answer lies on the battlefield where Zach witnessed the horror of war. Or is that just the beginning? To me, the motive is still a mystery. When Hurricane Katrina hit the Crescent City of New Orleans in 2005, the area and its people felt the violent wrath of Mother Nature. Many followed the mandatory evacuation and got out. Others met a different fate. In the end, the destruction was catastrophic for everyone. New Orleans was a ghost town. The French Quarter was empty. It was primitive lifestyle and primitive living for a long time. Zach Bowen and his girlfriend, Addie Hall, stay in the higher ground of the French Quarter and refuse to leave. They survive. But as residents return, there are a series of unexplained phenomena throughout the city. I would think that the paranormal activity has probably increased here with all of the people have died in the streets. Then on October 17, 2006, Zach leaps from the roof of the Omni Hotel in New Orleans, taking his own life in a matter of seconds and leaving millions of questions unanswered. He had a Ziploc bag that was found in his pocket with a, a suicide note and also dog tags, which is like military ID tags. Why would a young man like Zach, with his whole life ahead of him, end his own life? The search for answers begins years before Katrina hit with a tour of duty on the battlefields of Iraq. Zach enlisted in the military pre-9-11, which I think is very important to understand. The mindset, particularly for Zach, of folks who enlisted pre-9-11 is this is a great career for me. This is not, I go to war. But in 2003, at the start of the Iraq war, Zach is shipped off as part of the initial invasion of Baghdad. In just a few years, Zach goes from the comfort of New Orleans to the violence and brutality of war. Zach's time in Iraq was rough for him. He had become friends with an 18-year-old private. In the fall of 2003, she was killed, and he was devastated by that. 
So essentially, at the end of Zach's time in Iraq, and he decides, I want out. He begins purposefully failing physicals. At that point, the discharge process for Zach began. Despite a stellar military record, Zach receives a general discharge from the Army. As a result of that decision, he loses access to all health benefits, including psychological counseling. After arriving home, Zach struggles to get his life in order. Back in New Orleans, he has to take the worst jobs in the bar scene. He starts from square one. Many theorize that Zach's problems are rooted in the horrors of war that he witnessed. PTSD is post-traumatic stress disorder. In the Iraq war, there were all kinds of things that would qualify as a traumatic stressor. Losing friends, seeing people killed, smelling the dead. When you return home and everything is going pretty well, then you smell a particular smell like diesel oil. The emotion, the feeling, it can be a tremendous emotional situation that is like a tinderbox. It can go off at any time. Enter Katrina. Over 1,500 lives are lost in Louisiana alone. And Zach is in the middle of it all. Now imagine what that was like. Darkness that they have never experienced before. No birds, no living thing. What does that do to human beings? So for Zach, I think that there is lots of evidence to show that he potentially could be suffering from combat-related post-traumatic stress disorder. There could be all kinds of things happening in Zach's life at the time that would get him extremely worked up. These traumatic events can easily be tied to Zach's suicide, but the story doesn't end there. What happens next is unimaginable. We waited for the coroner's investigator to get there, and when he got there, he started going through Zach Bowen's pockets, the suicide note. When he actually found it, he said, I think we got something here, and he opened it up. As he started to read it, we didn't realize what he was gonna start reading. This is not accidental. I had to take my own life to pay for the one I took. The last thing I ever thought I'd hear was that he admitted to murdering his girlfriend. That was the furthest thing from our thoughts when he started to read it. Suicide and now murder. Although some point to PTSD as an explanation for Zach's crime, others like occult historian Aline Pistanio think that the rich spiritual history of New Orleans and the ghosts that roam here may have also played a role. We are located on St. John's Bayou, or today it's called Bayou St. John. This bayou is connected in many ways to the history of New Orleans, but also the history of New Orleans voodoo. Marie Laveau, voodoo queen of New Orleans, used to do her rituals here. Every year, she would have a huge gathering, which is called a bambula. All of the voodoozy from the city would meet her out here, and they would have rituals, dancing, partying, and worshiping the voodoo spirits. And that all went on along this bayou. People believe that because of Marie Laveau's ritual that there are spiritual hauntings here. And sometimes people can hear the drums and the, the songs and the dancing from years gone by. This bayou, with its long history of voodoo and black magic, is just a few miles from where Zach and Addie lived. Could the spiritual remnants left here have any connection to Zach's murder-suicide? The answer requires a deeper look into the mysticism of New Orleans. You have to understand, voodoo is a religion here. There are so many different faiths, so many different practices here. The Haitian tradition, the other traditions of South and Central America, and it's all amalgamated here. This is the, the oldest living voodoo city in America, and it has long, a long history. From the earliest days of its settling, slaves were present in the Louisiana colony, and they naturally brought with them their belief system. Now, most of those slaves came from the west coast of Africa, but we also have Native American influence that they met up with and communicated with on a level they were synchronized. The combination of cultures that merged over time created a unique form of voodoo, Louisiana and New Orleans voodoo. New Orleans is known to have a different kind of voodoo. 
than is recognized in other parts of the world. The purpose of voodoo is to put the individual in contact with the spirit and to raise up the consciousness, to reach from here and into the realm of spirit. But it's not just voodoo that thrives in New Orleans. The Catholic religion is actually the most common faith practiced here, and its presence is felt everywhere in the number of churches and cemeteries. With so much emphasis placed on the afterlife and its long history of natural disasters, many believe spirits of the dead still linger here and are welcome to stay for all eternity. New Orleans is a very old city. The dead don't rest easy here because of the way that we interact with the dead. We bury them above ground, we don't bury them below ground because of our high water table. And it's very easy to get a spirit attachment here in, in the city of New Orleans. The entire city of New Orleans is haunted. But could New Orleans' deep connection with the dead and its fascination with the occult have influenced Zach to the point of murder? Back at Zach and Addie's apartment in the French Quarter, Detective Marovich encounters what can best be described as horrific. We had to wait for the landlord to actually let us in. While we were waiting, we were on a stairwell, trying to prepare ourselves for what we were about to see, but we had no idea that it was going to be this serious and this much of a gruesome scene. Coming up, what discovery does Marovich make that rattles him to the core? No matter how many years you've been in law enforcement, Nothing prepares you for seeing that. On October 17, 2006, just a year after Hurricane Katrina devastated the city of New Orleans, Zach Bowen, a holdout who refused to leave the French Quarter during the evacuation, commits suicide. The first officers on the scene find dog tags from Zach's days in the Iraq War. They also find a suicide note, which gives a detailed description of how Zach had killed his girlfriend, Addie Hall, and where they could find her remains. Detective Tom Morovich is one of the first officers to arrive at the scene. into the kitchen you can see there was spray paint obviously on the stove when we saw that was let's look and see what this is because obviously it's something that one he wanted us to see that's when we actually saw the silver foil pan with body parts in it what appeared to be like a, a femur or a thigh that was apparently cooked we started looking around in other areas of the kitchen once we opened the refrigerator we were really shocked to find that there was a very large garbage bag in there and that was later discovered that it was actually a torso of a human female body on top of the stove, there was a tall pot with a lid on it, in which we opened up the lid, and actually you could see a, a human head in it. And it was also cooked down to where the, the actual flesh was coming off of the skull. We were all looking at each other like, what did we just see? No matter how many years you've been in law enforcement, nothing prepares you for seeing that. Police made a gruesome discovery in New Orleans. A note found on a man who committed suicide led them to a dismembered body inside an apartment in the French Quarter. The couple, who both worked as bartenders, had been profiled in news stories during Hurricane Katrina because they remained in the city despite evacuation orders after the storm struck. In another shocking turn of events, the police find a diary in the apartment in which Zach gives a detailed account of his crime. It described how he got to an argument with her and actually ended up squeezing her throat and choked her and uh, she suffocated. The diary also tells of uniquely bizarre behavior as Zach continues his descent into madness. We didn't know initially, but this murder took place almost really a week prior to us actually getting into the apartment. He went on about his daily life as if nothing happened and nothing was wrong. I'd actually slept in the bed and had her sleeping next to him. And there were some signs that he had had sex with the, uh, the corpse. Zach had spray painted messages on the walls of the apartment that's really tremendously affecting you realize what profound emotional distress this person was in according to the diary zach began to realize that he had to dispose of addie's body he used a hacksaw to dismember her in the bathtub and began cooking some of the pieces in the kitchen 
he quickly realized that he was not going to get away with it, I think, on one hand. And then on the other, he felt that his conscience wouldn't let him get away with it. So he spent about a week seeing friends and partying with friends in the French Quarter. It is unbelievably bizarre to think about Zach coming home to this apartment where there's a dismembered corpse in the kitchen. As more details of the crime are released, New Orleans struggles under the weight of what has happened. The impact of Addie's murder was profound in New Orleans because it came at a time the city was in an incredibly difficult emotional place and feeling very vulnerable. There was kind of talk about this Katrina crazy. People were being mentally affected by the aftermath of the storm. I think the whole city had it. But because of the gruesomeness of Zach's crime, some feel there's more to this tragic story. <laughs> I've seen quite a few murder scenes and everything failed in comparison to this. It's something that kind of haunts you because you're always trying to get to the bottom of what actually took place. It's hard to really understand this because it's above and beyond what normal reasoning people believe. We kind of said, how did we miss this? How did we not see that something like this had gone on? If you knew them as I knew them, you couldn't expect Zach to have killed Addie. It just didn't make sense that he had done this. What could have turned an otherwise decent man into a killer? What role did the spirits of New Orleans play in Zack's evil turn? There are a lot of components that went into this crime, and they're not all purely psychological. It wouldn't surprise me at all that there was a spiritual connection. With so many cemeteries and altars of black magic scattered throughout New Orleans, ghosts are not only present, but cared for by the living. So the phenomenon of having a spirit take control of a body is not uncommon. It's very easy to get a spirit attachment here in, in the city of New Orleans. Our relationship is very intimate with the supernatural. Maybe if Zach would have been in another town at another time and place, it might not have played out the way that it did. In fact, Zach and Addie's apartment was located directly above one of the city's more famous voodoo temples. And according to Aileen and other paranormal experts, the evacuation before the storm left temples like this void of human presence, but still teeming with spirits. It was a very active temple, and so what you had after Katrina was a palpable atmosphere full of spirits, and so whoever was there was their prey. In the case of Zack and Addie, these two individuals stayed during Katrina, so they were basically sitting ducks. To Aline, the note Zack left at the crime scene is a telltale sign of something out of Zack's control. Zack didn't know what he was doing. It was almost a detachment. Your own native spirit is pushed down to such an extent that you're basically a spectator to what your body is doing. I firmly believe that Zack was possessed. Coming up, could Aline's theory of possession explain Zach's out-of-body behavior? Then we look at the signs of demonic possession and hear from a young woman whose body was taken over by spirits and put through a living hell. Zach Bowen and Addie Hall refused to evacuate New Orleans in the hours before Hurricane Katrina wreaked havoc on the city. Then, just 14 months later, they were both dead. Why would this otherwise peaceful man do the unthinkable? Many point to the possible post-traumatic stress disorder from his days in the Iraq War. Others, like occult historian Aline Pastanio, believe that when New Orleans emptied during Katrina, the spirits that reside here needed something or someone to feed on. He was preyed upon by spirits. I firmly believe that Zach was possessed. Aline knows that demonic possessions are real. She had her own experience after a fellow member of the New Orleans occult community threatened her with a demonic curse. Aline did what she could to fight it off. An altar was set up in my house, and the alleged purpose of the altar was to trap this negative energy and basically send it back to whoever was sending it. Unfortunately for Aline, her plan to trap the negative energy backfired. 
and her actions resulted in a spirit attachment. I began to notice this sort of intrusion into my daily life. Something had been attracted by the elder. With the approach of the demonic into your life, it's usually preceded by increased fear and obsessive thoughts. In some extreme cases, this is murder. In other cases, with other individuals, it could be suicide. In some cases, as with me, it's just dwelling upon self-doubt, worry, and fear. Through fear, I had allowed something to happen that never should have happened. With the help of a voodoo priestess, Aline never felt the presence of the demonic spirit again. But how do we know that Zach Bowen was a victim of a demonic possession? Demons can influence any of us. While diagnosing a possession is an inexact science, cases have been reported for thousands of years in all practices of faith, including Christianity. If there's any doubt in anyone's mind as to the reality of demons, all you have to do is read the Bible. In the Bible, there are several references to possession, all deriving from the devil, Satan, or one of his lesser demons. But many cultures and religions believe in spiritual possession, and their roots date back far before the birth of Christianity. Sumerian culture. Many artifacts from the 2nd and 3rd millennium BC contain prayers to the gods to protect the people from various demons, entities they believed affected their well-being, both physically and mentally. Shamanism, a religious practice that dates back centuries where spirits both good and bad exist and play a large role in society, and sacrificial offerings are often used to ward them off. In voodoo cultures, like those practiced in many of the temples in New Orleans, practitioners actually bring spirits into them. The spirit uses their body for energy, while the practitioner gains prophecies and knowledge from the entity before it is released. But there are more modern cases of alleged possessions other than Zach and Aline. Lorette Sedita is a 23-year-old tattoo artist in New Orleans who also suffered the wrath of a tormenting spirit. We are at the old shop. This used to be an old service station. This area right here was my station. One night, I was standing by my toolbox. I just heard a very heavy sigh. It scared me. Eventually, Lorette learns the old shop had a tragic history. The spirit, he was a mechanic who worked at the service station. He was underneath the car and had a fatal heart attack. The spirit, who Lorette named Mike, continues to harass her. I think I was just very vulnerable. He really picked up on that and started feeding off of it. Late nights when I would be working, I would always know if Mike was around. I would get nauseated out of nowhere. I would just start sweating. I couldn't sleep at night. It was like there was something in my ear constantly. One night, Lorette captures this photo of the spirit lurking in the window. There would be times where I would see someone, or like a shadow figure, standing next to my bed. Eventually, Lorette is referred to an exorcist in Virginia who is able to free her from her possession. But she'll never get back those precious years that the spirit took from her. seeing this place again, I guess. Brought back bad memories. Possession comes in various forms, each with its own level of intensity and classification. Lorette experienced a clear-cut case of demonic oppression, but according to Elaine Pastanio, Zach's case was worse, demonic obsession. This is where you begin to feel anxiety, depression, thoughts of suicide, other thoughts of self-harm, harming others, and this is where I feel Zach was. And then the next level is a level of complete possession. Coming up, we'll go deep inside the madness of a full-blown demonic possession. 
And we'll revisit the tragic story of Zach Bowen and the supernatural power of New Orleans. Zach Bowen killed his girlfriend and himself in one of America's most haunted cities. During arguably the most spiritually active time in its long history. Was it because of Zack's traumatic past on the battlefield, or by staying in New Orleans during Katrina, that made himself susceptible to demonic possession? They became basically the prey for spirits that were abounding in the area. Most men of science don't believe in possession, but some have beheld horrors that science alone cannot explain. Dr. Richard Gallagher is one of them. A professor of psychiatry at New York Medical College and a trained psychoanalyst, Gallagher experienced an event so shocking, he became a believer. I'm a pretty skeptical person as a professor of psychiatry and a physician, but things have convinced me because I've seen them. When I went to my first exorcism, it was surprising and it was spooky. There was a priest who was saying the prayers in Latin, and the woman, who certainly knew no other language except English, let alone Latin, was responding to these prayers. The priest would say, Credo in unum Deum, I believe in one God. And the woman would respond, I don't believe in your God. The priest looked at me as if to say, boy, if this doesn't convince somebody, what would these phenomena really do exist? Dr. Gallagher served as a consultant for the Catholic Church in cases where an individual may have been taken over by a spirit. I've consulted about a thousand cases of alleged demonic possession. Of those thousand cases, I have judged 14 or 15 to be genuinely demonic cases. What happens in a genuine possession is the patient goes into a trance where a demonic voice comes out of them. And the voice sounds different than the individual's own. They will also tend to have some kind of abnormal strength. A woman I saw who was possessed took a deacon in her Protestant church and threw him across the room. The phenomena I've mentioned are so clearly in the realm of the paranormal that in the eyes of any sensible witness. The most disturbing case Gallagher ever witnessed involved a woman named Julia, who chose to have her exorcism recorded. She was quite violent and quite expressive of hatred towards anybody trying to help her. What was particularly convincing was for about a half an hour during one of her exorcisms, she rose up into the air. These are highly rare events. However, in my opinion, they unequivocally exist. People like to think of an exorcism as a kind of magical thing. The priest will do this incantation, the demon is whisked away. That's not really how exorcisms work. The demon's gonna fight you because he's made a conquest. I taught the demon anything I can think of, I hit him with. And they get mad and they rage, and that's when you know you got him. <laughs> They've got total control over the person. They make them hurt people, and they make them kill people. Was this what happened to Zach Bowen? Did his inner demons get the better of him? Or did a demonic spirit force him to kill and take his own life? I'm a very, very laid-back person. I don't have much of a temper at all. And Especially in relationship-wise, I mean, it's... I'm very easy to get along with. 
He was a regular guy. So what caused him to suddenly go off the rocket? There's only one answer. Zach was in the wrong place at the wrong time. I think he was exposed to negative spirits, and I do think that they took possession of him and caused him to commit a heinous crime. I would suspect that we will never know exactly what caused Zach to do that. I think the answer to the question of why did Zach kill Addie has a number of answers. I try not to think about the sort of paranormal aspects of this case. I think almost out of protection of my own sanity. The case is so disturbing on so many levels that to add that would really kind of tip it over the top for me. The people of New Orleans are all connected by their spirituality and perseverance in the face of an uncertain future. We may never know what happened to Zach and Addie, but one thing remains certain. After surviving the devastation of the perfect storm, Zach Bowen was thrust into the center of a new storm, one clouded in mystery and ending in tragedy. I think the Zach and Addie story, it's another French Quarter story. It's about love, New Orleans, Katrina, and really even the whole issue of the uh, Iraq War. And so I think it's sort of a compelling story of our times. I still speak with people today who say that they felt that what happened to Zach, you know, that could have been me. Feeling like they were in such a fragile place that they could see themselves completely going to pieces emotionally. And that Zach, in a way, was a very relatable character in some ways. People say all the freaks in New Orleans. New Orleans is one place where you'll be accepted for who you are. There's always somebody just like you better in the ...that went into this crime, and they're not all purely psychological. It wouldn't surprise me at all that there was a spiritual connection. With so many cemeteries and altars of black magic scattered throughout New Orleans, ghosts are not only present, but cared for by the living. So the phenomenon of having a spirit take control of a body is not uncommon. It's very easy to get a spirit attachment here in, in the city of New Orleans. Our relationship is very intimate with the supernatural. Maybe if Zach would have been in another town at another time and place, it might not have played out the way that it did. In fact, Zach and Addie's apartment was located directly above one of the city's more famous voodoo temples. And according to Aileen and other paranormal experts, the evacuation before the storm left temples like this void of human presence, but still teeming with spirits. It was a very active temple, and so what you had after Katrina was a palpable atmosphere full of spirits, and so whoever was there was their prey. In the case of Zach and Addie, these two individuals stayed during Katrina, so they were basically sitting ducks. To Aline, the note Zach left at the crime scene is a telltale sign of something out of Zach's control. Zach didn't know what he was doing. It was almost a detachment. Your own native spirit is pushed down to such an extent that you're basically a spectator to what your body is doing. It was a detailed description of how Zach had killed his girlfriend, Addie Hall, and where they could find her remains. Detective Tom Morovich is one of the first officers to arrive at the scene. When we came into the kitchen, you could see there was spray paint, obviously, on the stove. When we saw that, it was, let's look and see what this is, because obviously it's something that wanted, he wanted us to see. That's when we actually saw the silver foil pan with body parts in it, what appeared to be like a, a femur or a thigh that was apparently cooked. We started looking around in other areas of the kitchen. Once we opened the refrigerator, we were really shocked to find that there was a very large garbage bag in there. And that was later discovered that it was actually a torso of a human female body. On top of the stove, there was a tall pot with a lid on it, in which we opened up the lid and actually you could see a, a human head in it. And it was also cooked down to where the, the actual flesh was coming off of the skull. We were all looking at each other like, what did we just see? No matter how many years you've been in law enforcement, nothing prepares you for seeing that. Police made a gruesome discovery in New Orleans. A note found on a man who committed suicide led them to a dismembered body inside an apartment in the French Quarter. 
The couple, who both worked as bartenders, had been profiled in news stories during Hurricane Katrina because they remained in the city despite evacuation orders after the storm struck. ...of one of the worst natural disasters on record. That was... a scary deal. A love story rises above the rubble. They felt like they owned the city. But as the city rebuilds around them, this couple's tale turns deadly. I've seen quite a few murder scenes and everything paled in comparison to this. It's one of the most gruesome crimes in New Orleans history. We were all looking at each other like, what did we just see? The search for answers takes us to the paranormal. It's very easy to get a spirit attachment in the city of New Orleans. What role did this killer storm have in one man's living nightmare? City was abandoned, so they were basically sitting ducks. I firmly believe that he was possessed. Prepare to go deep into the darkness of the unknown, exploring real tales of demonic possession and exorcism in one of the most haunted cities in America. Some of these spirits, I don't believe there's good, bad. Maybe there is. America is filled with dark and traumatic events. There are some who believe these events leave evidence of what took place. Hot spots filled with unexplained activity. These are the stories of haunted history. The idyllic time where they basically felt like they owned the city. At Addie's apartment on Governor Nichols Boulevard, the couple partied up with the few locals that held out. Their spirit and energy make them favorites in the French Quarter. This is where they really fell in love. This is where they got to know each other under these, you know, incredible circumstances of Katrina. After the floodwaters recede, citizens slowly make their way back into the city. Zach and Addie began to realize very quickly that the city is going to be repopulated. And the world that they had shared during Katrina was over. The daily life of work and paying bills came back very quickly. And this really threw the both of them out of sorts. Zach and Addie aren't the only ones out of sorts. The citizens returning begin to realize not only has New Orleans been devastated, but a paranormal force is rising. New Orleans is a very historic city and it's always been very spiritually active. After the storm, it's become very active in terms of paranormal activity. Could be because after the storm, things were stirred up. Spiritual activity is increasing throughout the city. Only now, it's much darker. After Hurricane Katrina, the spiritual energy was just very negative. The whole city literally had a wretched stench to it. You could almost call it like the stench of death. You could... Could the spiritual remnants left here have any connection to Zack's murder-suicide? The answer requires a deeper look into the mysticism of New Orleans. You have to understand, voodoo is a religion here. There are so many different faiths, so many different practices here. The Haitian tradition, the other traditions of South and Central America, and it's all amalgamated here. This is the, the oldest living voodoo city in America, and it has long, a long history. From the earliest days of its settling, slaves were present in the Louisiana colony, and they naturally brought with them their belief system. Now, most of those slaves came from the west coast of Africa, but we also have Native American influence that they met up with and communicated with on a level they were synchronized. The combination of cultures that merged over time created a unique form of voodoo, Louisiana and New Orleans voodoo. New Orleans is known to have a different kind of voodoo than is recognized in other parts of the world. The purpose of voodoo is to put the individual in contact with the spirit and to raise up the consciousness, to reach from here and into the realm of spirit. But it's not just voodoo that thrives in New Orleans. The Catholic religion is... Gentlemen, this is the real deal. There is a major, major hurricane that has New Orleans in its sights. Mayor Ray Nagan called a mandatory evacuation order, but he called it very late. The worst part of the storm is almost here.
Because of the tide surge from the relentless rain and winds, 53 levees around the perimeter of the city breach, causing catastrophic flooding. The trees were blowing in a zillion directions and the water was rising so quickly. The water rose probably five feet in the first five minutes. Here it comes, it's in the house. Oh no. Sure thought I'd die initially. We thought we had avoided the worst. And then at 7 p.m., we were told to expect eight additional feet of water. Many of in the city were streaming toward the Superdome. By 8 o'clock that night, we had probably taken on 12,000 people. That was uh, a scary deal. No lights, no police. It was sort of a, uh, a war zone looking area. You felt threatened. You were afraid. We didn't know what the future was going to be. You know, there was just a lot of unknowns. Many citizens make it out. Others weren't so lucky. The famed French Quarter. Known for its Mardi Gras celebrations and bohemian culture, it's one of the oldest parts of the city. And one of the highest, in some spots sitting 10 feet above sea level. This is where a few brave residents choose to stay and face the storm together. And this is where Zack's story begins. was unusually tall. I'm six foot two, and I had to look up to see Zach. I like to think I'm somewhere, but I was, I like poetry, I'm a musician. My paying profession is a bartender. I'm also a drummer on the side, which will hopefully be my paying profession. I've been playing drums since I was four years old, being on lots of bands in the kitchen, and driving my mom back. Zach always came across as kind of a calm, kind of quiet guy. Really, he felt, you felt Zach was a gentle spirit. I'm a very, very laid back person. I don't have much of a temper at all. Ethan Brown experience after a fellow member of the New Orleans occult community threatened her with a demonic curse. Aline did what she could to fight it off. An altar was set up in my house. And the alleged purpose of the altar was to trap this negative energy and basically send it back to whoever was sending it. Unfortunately for Aline, her plan to trap the negative energy backfired, and her actions resulted in a spirit attachment. I began to notice this sort of intrusion into my daily life. Something had been attracted by the altar. With the approach of the demonic into your life, it's usually preceded by increased fear and obsessive thoughts. In some extreme cases, this is murder. In other cases, with other individuals, it could be suicide. In some cases, as with me, it's just dwelling upon self-doubt, worry, and fear. Through fear, I had allowed something to happen that never should have happened. With the help of a voodoo priestess, Aline never felt the presence of the demonic spirit again. But how do we know that Zach Bowen was a victim of a demonic possession? Demons can influence any of us. While diagnosing a possession is an inexact science, cases have been reported for your old private. In the fall of 2003, she was killed. And he was devastated by that. So essentially, at the end of Zach's time in Iraq, and he decides, I want out. He begins purposefully failing physicals. At that point, the discharge process for Zach began. Despite a stellar military record, Zach receives a general discharge from the army. As a result of that decision, he loses access to all health benefits, including psychological counseling. After arriving home, Zack struggles to get his life in order. Back in New Orleans, he has to take the worst jobs in the bar scene. He starts from square one. 
Many theorize that Zack's problems are rooted in the horrors of war that he witnessed. PTSD is post-traumatic stress disorder. In the Iraq war, there were all kinds of things that would qualify as a traumatic stressor. Losing friends, seeing people killed, smelling the dead. When you return home and everything is going pretty well, then you smell a particular smell like diesel oil. The emotion, the feeling, it can be a tremendous emotional situation that is like a tinderbox. It can go off at any time. Enter Katrina. Over 1,500 lives are lost in the... We exactly would have been in another town at another time and place. It might not have played out the way that it did. In fact, Zach and Addie's apartment was located directly above one of the city's more famous voodoo temples. And according to Aileen and other paranormal experts, the evacuation before the storm left temples like this void of human presence, but still teeming with spirits. It was a very active temple, and so what you had after Katrina was a palpable atmosphere full of spirits, and so whoever was there was their prey. In the case of Zach and Addie, these two individuals stayed during Katrina, so they were basically sitting ducks. To Aline, the note Zach left at the crime scene is a telltale sign of something out of Zach's control. Zach didn't know what he was doing. It was almost a detachment. Your own native spirit is pushed down to such an extent that you're basically a spectator to what your body is doing. I firmly believe that Zach was possessed. Coming up, could Aline's theory of possession explain Zach's out-of-body behavior? Then we look at the signs of demonic possession and hear from a young woman whose body was taken over by spirits and put through a living hell. Ghosts are not only present, but cared for by the living. So the phenomenon of having a spirit take control of a body is not uncommon. It's very easy to get a spirit attachment here in, in the city of New Orleans. Our relationship is very intimate with the supernatural. Maybe if Zach would have been in another town at another time and place, it might not have played out the way that it did. In fact, Zach and Addie's apartment was located directly above one of the city's more famous voodoo temples. And according to Aileen and other paranormal experts, the evacuation before the storm left temples like this void of human presence, but still teeming with spirits. It was a very active temple, and so what you had after Katrina was a palpable atmosphere full of spirits, and so whoever was there was their prey. In the case of Zach and Addie, these two individuals stayed during Katrina, so they were basically sitting ducks. To Aline, the note Zach left at the crime scene is a telltale sign of something out of Zach's control. Zach didn't know what he was doing. It was almost a detachment. Your own native spirit is pushed down to such an extent that you're basically a spectator to what your body is doing. I firmly believe that Zach was possessed. Coming up, could Aline's theory of possession ex... But in 2003, at the start of the Iraq War, Zach is shipped off as part of the initial invasion of Baghdad. In just a few years, Zach goes from the comfort of New Orleans to the violence and brutality of war. Zach's time in Iraq was rough for him. He had become friends with an 18-year-old private in the fall of 2003. She was killed. And he was devastated by that. So essentially, at the end of Zach's time in Iraq, and he decides, I want out. He begins purposefully failing physicals. At that point, the discharge process for Zach began. Despite a stellar military record, Zach receives a general discharge from the army. As a result of that decision, he loses access to all health benefits, including psychological counseling. After arriving home, Zach struggles to get his life in order. Back in New Orleans, he has to take the worst jobs in the bar scene. He starts from square one. 
Many theorize that Zack's problems are rooted in the horrors of war that he witnessed. PTSD is post-traumatic stress disorder. In the Iraq war, there were all kinds of things that would qualify as a traumatic stressor. Losing friends.